Okay, I just sent out the live stream link. So we just have a few more seconds before um, we start, but just for all of the panelists, we are being streamed, just FYI for <laughs> what you said. Okay, you guys ready to start? Uh, sure. Did you want to do the same kind of housekeeping intro from yesterday? Totally. Sure. I'll start there. So hi, everyone. My name's Blunt. I use she, her pronouns. I'll be helping just moderate the chat um, and with any tech things. I'm with Hacking Hustling, a collective of sex workers and accomplices working at the intersection of tech and social, social justice to interrupt state surveillance and violence that's facilitated by technology. Um, a few housekeeping things. You can turn the captioning on if you want it. It should be on the bottom right side of your screen or you might have to click the ellipses and click more. And if you could just put the questions into the Q&A, that will be the easiest way for us to moderate. Um, we do want to make sure that like, this training is for you, the participants. So if there's something that you don't understand, please feel free to just ask for the presenters to slow down or to explain something, because we want this to be for you. Um, I wanted to share with some values, shared agreements, and intentions for today. <laughs> We believe that sex work is a valid form of labor, that our vulnerabilities are the result of the socio-cultural approach to transactional sex. We believe in decriminalization, decarceration, and the divestment from state violence. We believe that access to more opportunities, not less, is the path of harm reduction and safety. And that sex workers who use the internet platforms are just one part of the larger world of people who engage in commercial sex. And we value all forms of transactional sex. And I'll let you guys take it from here. 
Hi everyone, um, my name is Olivia, my pronouns are she, her, um, co-facilitating with Ingrid, um, and some of the values that this particular digital literacy slash defense workshop will be centered in um, include um, cyber defense, less as a way of uh, military technology, right? Reframing cryptography as more of an abolitionist technology, right? And cyber defense as an expression of mutual care um, and a way of accumulating community-based power. Um, and in that way, also thinking of ways to teach this type of material in ways that are anti-racist, um, but also anti-binary and pro-fem. Um, and so we're really, uh, we really care a lot about making sure that this is trauma-informed um, and teaching from a place of gentleness, considering the previous digital harm people have experienced and trying not to relive it. So if at any point you need to take a break, um, remember that this uh, is being recorded and posted online so you'll be able to access it later. Great, um, thank you, Olivia. Uh, my name is Ingrid, I use she, her pronouns and um, welcome back to people who were here yesterday. Um, Today we are, are talking about platforms. Um, and in this context, we primarily mean social media sites like Facebook and Instagram. Um, some of this, you know, it can be applied to contexts where people kind of buy and sell stuff, but essentially we're, we're talking about places where people make user accounts to communicate with each other and ways in which, but with kind of more of a focus on kind of the large corporate ones that many people are on. Um, there were four sort of key concepts we wanted to cover. Um, there's a lot in them, so we'll try to move through them smoothly. Uh, first kind of being algorithmic curation um, and the ways that that can produce uh, misinformation and content suppression. And um, some of the, the laws and legal contexts that are uh, defining decisions that platforms make. Um, it, we talked a little bit about this uh, yesterday but you know reiterating again uh platforms are companies and a lot of the decisions they make come out of being concerned with keeping a company alive more than taking care of people <laughs> um so we're gonna start with uh algorithmic curation and um i think there's there's a thing also that came up yesterday was a tendency for technical language to kind of alienate uh audiences that don't know as much about computers or math, I guess. Um, and an algorithm is a long word that, uh, sorry, that's the sound of my dog knocking on my door in the background. Um, broadly speaking, an algorithm is a set of uh, rules or instructions. Excuse me one second. She just really wants attention. Um, I'm sorry, you can't see her. She's very cute. But uh, an algorithm is a set of rules or instructions for how to do a thing. Like you could think of a recipe or choreography. The difference between an algorithm used in the context of a platform um, and an algorithm that contains, you know, ingredients for a recipe is that there is a lot less flexibility and in interpretation in an algorithm. And um, it's usually applied on a much larger scale. Um, and the reason that a lot of platforms uh, if deploy uh, algorithmic curation um, and what algorithmic curation is experienced as is often um, recommendation algorithms um, and algorithms that determine what content is going to show up in a social media timeline. So um, I am, you know, I have recently been watching Avatar The Last Airbender on Netflix. Uh, I am 33 years old, and uh, I found that, um, you know, Netflix wants to make sure that I know they have lots of other things that I might like because I like that show, right? And you could kind of think of the algorithms as being kind of like, if this, then that rules. Like, if somebody watches this show, look at all the other people who watch that show and the other shows that they watched and suggest that, you know, you probably will like those. And the, you know, platforms give the rationale for deploying these kinds of algorithms partly as trying to help people, right? Like discover things because there's so much content and you'll get overwhelmed. So we prioritize. What it actually kind of in practice means is trying to keep you using a service, right? Like I'm 
probably gonna cancel my Netflix account once I finish Avatar. So, but like, oh no, I gotta watch The Dragon Prince now, right? Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure if I do this part or if Olivia does this part. Um, do you want me to do it or do you wanna take over? Uh, I can I can do it. I um. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I couldn't remember how we split up this section. Um, I so um in early social media we didn't really um have super complicated algorithms like the ones we do now. Um, you you have the like find your friends algorithms. Um that would basically like show you perhaps like the friends of your friends, but the people you follow were mostly the only people whose posts you would see. Um, but now that um, we're able to collect more user data about how you're using the platform, as well as your activities off the platform, now algorithms are able to become more complicated because there's so much more information that they're able to use. Um, so some of the things that might be going into your algorithmic uh, curation are listed here. It's a really long list and not all the things that are on this list are even, um, not all the things that are on this list are even like the long exhaustive list of things that might be factoring into your alg algorithm because so few platforms actually disclose what are the things that um, contribute to the stuff that you see and what you don't see um, and who's seeing your own content and the people who don't see your own content. Um, but one thing that we know for sure is that um, the way that these platforms are designed is specifically in order to make money. Um, and so following that motive, you're able to kind of map a lot of the predicted behavior of some of them. Um, and one of the really big consequences of these like algor algorithmic filter bubbles is misinformation, right? Um, so because we've all been inside for the past couple of weeks and months, we're all really susceptible to seeing really targeted misinformation because we've been online a lot. And so it's quite possible that more data is being collected about you now than ever before. Um, platforms make money off of our content, but especially content that encourages like anti-social behaviors. And when I say anti-social behaviors, um, I mean specifically like anti-social versus pro-social behaviors, right? One of these categories encourages a healthy boundary of social media with like potentially light to moderate use, right? Complimenting people, letting people know that they rock, cheering someone up, right? Supporting people um, versus anti-social behaviors um, while they're much less healthy, um, they encourage people to use social media like three times as much, right? If people are spreading rumors, if people are posting personal information, if people are being ignored or excluded or editing videos or photos or saying mean things, right? Um, and so that makes an environment where misinformation does super well algor algorithmically. Um, through their design, especially platforms like Instagram and Twitter, uh, they prioritize posts that receive a lot of lots of attention. We see this like how people ask um, others to like posts um, that belong to particular people so that they'll be boosted in the algorithm in the algorithm, right? They prioritize posts that get a lot of clicks and that get a lot of like feedback from the community. And it's really easy to create misinformation campaigns that will take advantage of that. Should I just play this? Yes. Yeah, it's like 38 seconds, I think. Thank <laughs> you. 
yes, that was a really quick video from the Mozilla Foundation. Um, but I wanted to clarify that there's this assumption that people who fall for misinformation are like kind of dumb or they're not like thinking critically. And this is like kind of a really ableist assumption, right? And in truth, anyone could unknowingly share misinformation. That's like how these campaigns are designed, right? And there's so many different forms that, mis that misinformation takes. Um, it could be like regular old lies, dressed up as memes, um, fabricated photos and videos that look super real, even though they're not, um, performance art and like social experiments, um, links to sources um, that don't actually point anywhere. Um, and it could have been information that was originally true, but then you told it to your friend who got the story kind of confused and now it's not true in a way that's really, really important. Uh, and of course, there's also conspiracy theories um, and misleading political advertisements as well. Um, but sometimes misinformation is less about being not told, being told a lie and more about not being told the truth, if that makes sense. So the easiest way to avoid misinformation is to just get in the habit of verifying what you read before you tell someone else. Um, even if you heard it first from someone that you trust, right? Maybe one of your friends shared misinformation, and but my friend is a really nice, upstanding citizen, right? There's no way that, uh, oh, that's, I don't know, just being a citizen doesn't matter. My friend is a nice person, um, and not always um, are the people, who, people who share misinformation aren't always doing it to stir their pot. They just got confused, or they just ended up in a trap really um so check the fact check the information that confuses you or surprises you but also fact check information that falls in line with your beliefs fact check all of it because you're more likely to see misinformation that falls in line with your beliefs because of the algorithmic curation that we talked about before right we have an internet that's like 70% lies. So two sites that were pretty popular when I asked around how people fact checked were PolitiFacts and Snip.com. But you can also just do a regular internet search engine. You could use Google, but then it might also be good to use DuckDuckGo at the same time. Um, you could ask a librarian. Um, but also, if you look at a post specifically on like Instagram or Twitter and you scroll through the thread, there might be people saying like, hey, this isn't true. Why would you post it? Um, so always be a little bit, always be, be a little bit more thorough when you are interacting with information online. Sorry, I was still muted. Um <laughs> So the uh, the next sort of thing we wanted to talk about that's a you know consequence of algorithmic curation and uh, company like platforms being companies is suppression of content on platforms. Right, um, platforms have their own terms of service and rules uh, about what people can and can't say on them, and those um, terms of service and rules are usually written in very long documents in very dense legal language uh, that can make it hard to understand when you break those rules and are kind of designed to you know, be scrolled through and ignored. Um, and we wanted to, and, and, but because a lot of the decisions about what is like, you know, acceptable content or unacceptable content are again being made by an algorithm looking for keywords for example, um, the platforms can kind of downgrade content based on assumptions about what's there. Um, so shadow banning is a concept that I imagine many of you have heard about or you know encountered, possibly even experienced. Uh, it actually originally is a term that came from uh, like online messages and forums, so not an automated uh, or algorithmic context at all. Um, basically, it was a tool used by moderators for, uh, you know, forum members who liked to start fights or kind of, you know, were shit stirrers. 
and would basically be sort of a muting of that individual on the platform so they could you know still post but people weren't seeing their posts and they weren't getting interaction so they weren't getting like whatever rise they wanted to get out of people um today the common or more common kind of application of the term has been describing platform-wide essentially muting of users from like the main timeline or making it hard to search for that individual's content based on what is thought to be automated interpretation of content. Um, I say what's thought to be automated interpretation of content because there is a lot that is only kind of known about what's happening um, on the other side of the platform. Um, again, yeah, what it often looks like is not showing up in search unless someone types the entirety of a handle. Even if you follow that person, that person's content not showing up in the main timeline, uh, like in their follower speeds, not showing up on a hashtag. Um, and shadow banning is like a really like gaslighty experience because it's, you know, it is hard to know, is this a result of like, what I'm saying is not like people don't like it or people just don't care anymore or am I being actively suppressed and people just can't see me. Um, and if it's something that has happened to you or is happening to you, you know, one thing that, you know, is important to remember is like, you will feel very isolated, but you are in fact like not alone. This is a thing that happens. It's often sort of, it's been over time kind of dismissed by platforms as myths or kind of, and I think I've wonder, I wonder if in some ways, like perhaps the, their aversion to it comes from associating it with this less automated context, because it's like, well, we're not deliberately trying to like mute anybody. It's, it's just our systems kind of doing something, but the systems are working, you know, they designed them and they're working as designed, right? Um, Instagram recently in making an announcement about work that they wanna do to address sort of implicit bias in their platform, sort of implicitly acknowledged that that shadow banning exists. They didn't actually use the term, um, but it is interesting to see platforms acknowledging that there are ways that their tools will affect people. Um, in terms of the, the what you can do, and, and um, Glenn, if you have anything you want to add to that, uh, I would totally be happy to hear it because I'm you know far from an expert. Um, it's a lot of what the sort of like best practices tend to be based on what other people have shared as like working for them. Um, that's, so I basically, I don't want to tell you anything and say like, this is a guarantee this will like work for, for you in any given context. One thing that um, I have seen a lot of is um, basically posting really normy content, um, like just going very off script from whatever your normal feed is uh, and doing something like, I don't know, talking about your pet or having, uh, you know, talking about like cooking, like basically just like changing what you're doing. Um, another approach is getting your friends and followers to engage with your content so that it's seen as popular so that it will like return to the timeline. Um, Blend, is there anything else that, that you would wanna include in there? Yeah, I think something that communities found to be useful is that if you are going to be automating uh, posts to do it on a backup, account so that what's flagged as bot like behavior is so your promo account might be shadow banned but you might have a wider reach that can direct people to where to give you money um but it's a really it's a really complex topic i've been thinking about it a lot right now as i was just um hacking hustling is currently studying shadow banning to sort of uh what we found so far is that a lot of our data backs up what sex workers know to be true about how, how shadow banning works um, and what sort of seems to trigger it and ways to undo it. Um, but as I was making a thread about the research, which both included the words sex worker and shadow banning, I was like, I don't even know if I can say either of these words without being shadow banned. Um, so then I like, I write sex work with lots of weird spaces in it so that maybe the algorithm won't recognize it, which also makes it totally inaccessible to someone who's using an, ac an accessibility reader. So I don't think there's any way to know all of it. I know Liara Rue had a class on how to reverse a shadow ban that was super effective, but I also think that um, after the protests, the global protests started that the 
uh, algorithm changed a little bit because we were noticing a lot, a, a higher increase of um, activist and sex worker content suppressed in the algorithm. Um, yeah, that's, do you, what, do you know when you're going to be putting out some of the research from the Hacking House has been doing? Yeah, we just tweeted out a few of our statistics in light of the recent uh, Twitter shenanigans and uh, <laughs> um, some internal screenshots being shared where they say that they blacklist users, <laughs> which is not a term I knew that they used to describe this process. Um, we're in the initial analysis of the data stages right now, and we'll probably, our, our goal is to share this information primarily with community, so we'll be sharing findings as we are able to, and then the full report will probably come out in like two to three months. Um, I think, uh, oh, sorry, I'm seeing a question. Have you found that the algorithm can judge video content? I know nudity and photos are flagged. Um, I would defer to Blunt on this question, actually. Um, I would say, yeah, I've had videos take, I've lost access to YouTube um, from videos. So I think anything that you post with a, either a link for sex work or just links in general and photos are more likely to be flagged. Um, so like personally, I notice a lot my posts that are just text-based show up higher and more frequently in the algorithm and on the feed. Um, yeah, so the, the other kind of form of suppression we wanted to mention and talk about um, is not as algorithmic. Uh, it's when you know the state gets involved. Um, so platforms are companies. Companies are expected to follow rules. Rules are made by governments. Sometimes it it'll kind of look like uh, shadow banning. So um, TikTok has been reported to basically down uh, rank certain kinds of content on the site, uh, or like not you know have it show up in a for you page or on your follow page, um, depending on laws in a country around homosexuality. Um, sometimes it, it's, you know, a result of companies creating uh, rules that are sort of presented as being about national security, but are actually about suppressing dissent. So in, in Vietnam and the Philippines, there have been rules basically made that mean that have made the contents of social media posts uh, seen as, you know, potentially, you know, threats against the state, basically. Um, and sometimes there are rules about uh, protecting the vulnerable that are actually about, you know, some, some moral majority bullshit, uh, which seems like a good time to, to start talking about, about sort of legal contexts. Um, and a lot of this is, uh, all of this particular section um, is really a USA context. And I, I feel like I should, I wanted to kind of give some explanation for that because I feel we're doing this like broad sweep of like, other kind of like countries approaches um, and focusing so much on the United States. But the reason for doing that is basically America as you know, an imperialist nation uh, tends to have an outsized impact on um, what happens on global platforms overall. Um, and there's, you know, two reasons for this one is that most of these companies are located in the United States, uh, like their headquarters are here. So they are, you know, beholden <laughs> to the laws of the place. Um, but secondly, uh, it's, it's also about sort of markets, right? Like the, if you, you know, like if Facebook decides, like, is like, we don't need the American consumer base, like it's probably going to affect their ability to make money. Um, and there are exceptions in terms of like the ways that other law, like law kind of impacts like platforms, like structures and decisions. Um, and we'll talk we talked a little bit yesterday about European privacy laws, but we'll try and bring a little more in tomorrow about those. Um, first kind of job, the category of laws, like this is a little bit of a, of a tangent, but it came up yesterday. So I want to kind of mention it. Um, this is an image from um, the account shutdown guide that Hacking Hustling made um, that I did some work on. And basically platforms that, you know, can facilitate financial transactions, um, which can be something, you know, like, Stripe, PayPal, or Venmo, but you know, 
uh, that basically they have to work with banks and credit card companies. And banks and credit card companies uh, have, can kind of consider sex work related purchases to be like high risk, despite there being very little um, evidence that this is true. The, the reason sometimes given is like the possibility of a chargeback, um, meaning, you know, hypothetical heteronormative, you know, sitcom scenario of like, I don't want my wife to see this charge on our bill. So like, you know, says it's like reports it and it gets taken off or something. Um, how much that like actually is the case, unclear. Um, it's also like, they're just kind of jerks. Uh, and, you know, plat but like platforms don't actually have a lot of ability to um, kind of decide, like to actually like argue with these companies because they control the movement of money um, around like everywhere. <laughs> so um, in some ways they kind of, there's, you know, they kind of just have to fall in line. I mean, th that being said, companies themselves are also like kind of dumb. I wasn't sure whether this needed to be included, but like I did this straight blog post at, like explaining why businesses aren't allowed. Um, they have a section on businesses that pose a brand risk. And um, they, they have this whole thing about like, it's like, oh, it's our financial partners don't want to be associated with them. It's not us, but like, yeah, fuck out of here, Stripe. Um, back to other laws. <laughs> Uh, so section 230 is a term that you, maybe you've heard, maybe you haven't, um, that describes a small piece of a big law that has a very large impact on how platforms operate and in fact the, that platforms exist at all. So in the 1990s, uh, lawmakers were very stressed out about porn on the internet um, because it was 1996 and everyone was, just didn't know what to do. And uh, a bill called the Communication Decency Act was passed in 1996. Um, most of it was uh, invalidated by the United States Supreme Court on kind of First Amendment grounds. Section 230 was not. Um, Section 230 is a part of the CDA. It is the 230th section of it. It's a very long bill uh, that is really important for how platforms operate because uh, it, says that platforms like or people who run hosting services are not responsible when somebody posts something illegal or, you know, in this case, smut. I, I can't believe that there was a newspaper headline that just said internet smut, it's so silly. Um, but that the platform, the hosting service, they're not responsible for that content. The original poster is responsible. Um, like if you wanted to, sue someone for libel. Like you would not sue the person who hosted a libelous website, you would sue the creator of the libelous website. And this was initially added to the Communications Decency Act because there was concern, really because of capitalism, there was concern that uh, if, if people were afraid of getting sued because somebody you know, used their services to do something illegal or use their services to post something that they could get sued for, that people would just not go into the business. They would not make hosting services. They would not build forums or platforms. And so it, it removing that kind of legal liability opened up more space for, for uh, platforms to emerge. It's in some ways, it's a fucked up compromise insofar as it means that when Facebook does nothing about fascists organizing on their platform and fascists actually go do things in the world, um, Facebook can't be held responsible for it, right? Um, I mean, let's, you know, I, the, the, uh, you know, the Charlottesville rally of 2017 started as a Facebook event and Facebook obviously got some really bad PR for it. But um, then again, you know, writing exceptions for things that were like platforms are responsible for this or that, um, tend to be made not based on uh, trying to kind of like meaningfully support people with less power or, but usually about what powerful people think are priorities, such as the first uh, effort in 2018 to uh, change or create exceptions to section 230, um, which was FOSTA SESTA. Um, it was sold originally as um, fighting trafficking. Um, the full FOSTA and SESTA are both acronyms. Um, uh, FOSTA is the Allow States and Victims to Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. Um, SESTA is the Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act. Um, but the actual like 
text of the law uses the term promotion or facilitation of prostitution and reckless disregard of sex trafficking. So basically it's, it's kind of lumping sex work into all sex trafficking, which yeah, that's not, not so wise. Um, and what it essentially creates is, is a situation where companies that allow that uh, allow prostitution or facilitation of prostitution and reckless disregard of sex trafficking to happen on their platform can be held legally responsible for that happening. Um, the, the day that Fosta and Sesto was signed into law, Craigslist took down the personal section of its website. Um, it has generally heightened scrutiny of uh, sex worker content across platforms and made it a lot harder for that work to happen online. And, and in some ways, one of the scary things about Fosta is the ways in which it potentially emboldens uh, further uh, kind of attempts to create more overreaching laws. The Earn It Act is not a law yet. It is one that is currently being uh, discussed in, in Congress. Um, it emerged as, as, or it's the way that it has been framed as a response to an investigative series that happened at the New York Times um, about uh, the proliferation of sexual images of children on uh, platforms. Um, and this, this is a true thing. It's like, a, like basically any, any service that allows uploading of images has this problem. Airbnb direct messages can be used, are used. Um, like, it's, and it's a real thing, but this is the actual law is a very cynical appropriation of this problem with a solution that really serves more to kind of control and contain how the internet like works. Um, it proposes creating a 19 member committee of experts headed by the attorney general uh, who would be issuing best practices for companies and websites and allow those that don't follow the best practices to be sued. And what best practices actually means is current, is like very vague in the actual text of, of the bill. Um, the word encryption does not actually appear in the text of the bill, but its authors uh, have a long history of being anti-encryption. Um, the current attorney general, Bill Barr, has expressed wanting backdoors for government agencies uh, so that they can look at encrypted content. Um, and likely it could, you know, it's thought that it could likely kind of make a best practice things like make it easier for the government to spy on content. Um, this is, you know, it's, I know somebody who worked on this series and it is so frustrating to me to see that effort turned into, how about we just kill most of, you know, what keeps people safe on the internet? Um, and so I mentioned this, like, this is more a thing that is good to pay attention to. You write Congress people about, um, Hacking Hustling has done, oh, Blunt would like me to define encryption. Um, so in, in, encryption is a mechanism for keeping information like accessible only to people who know how to decode it. Um, it is a way of keeping information safe in a way. Um, and the ability, and it's, the introduction encryption was actually not inherently part of the early internet because it was originally created by uh, researchers working for the government who thought it would just be government documents moving around it. So they were all public anyway, but um, it has since been kind of normalized into a part of like just using the internet as we know it today. Um, but it's in this context, um, it's a, yeah, basically it means that when, if I wanna send you a message that the only people who can read that message are like you and me and not the service that is moving the message around um, or that, like not like the chat app that we're using. That was, I feel like that was a little bit garbled, but um, I don't know if you'd like, if, you, if Olivia, is there anything that you would wanna to add to that um, or a better version of that? <laughs> um. I think it, I think you've mostly said it in terms of um, it's like a way of like encoding information so that um, someone might know that information is present, but they don't know what it says. Um, so it when we have things like end to end encryption on the Internet, um, it means that 
uh, something is encrypted in my on my side and no matter like say who th what third party tries to look at the message that I sent to you um, while it's in transit it can't be seen then and it also can't be seen by them um, on the other side because the person who I sent the message to has their own like code that allows them to decode the message that's specific to them. And this happens on a lot of platforms without our knowledge um, in the sense that apps that are end-to-end -end encrypted like Signal, they don't really tell you what your key is. Um, even though you have one and the person that you're talking to has one, it's not like you're encoding and decoding it yourself because the math is done by other things. Uh, but if the bill goes out of its way to exclude encryption, then it might make it um, potentially illegal for these services to exist, which would be a really bad thing for journalists and activists and sex workers and like everybody. Yeah, and, and additionally, there is, I mean, within the, the world of people who work on encryption and security tools, um, any, and the idea of creating a backdoor or some way to like sneakily decrypt a thing without somebody knowing is that that creates a vulnerability that uh, essentially it creates a vulnerability that essentially um, anyone else could exploit. Like if if it exists there, then it's like some somebody will hack it and figure it out. Um, the thing is, like, the that only one person can use. Yeah. Um, Natalia, on the response, it's not, earn it is not a response solely to one article by the New York Times, it was a series of seven articles. Um, but, and when I say in response, that is the argument, that was the statement made by the people who wrote the bill. I think that it was more that earn it was proposed by some Congress people who saw an opportunity to uh, cheaply exploit outrage over uh, like abuse of children to put forward some policies that they would want to have happen anyway. Um, I think like the, it's, it's, and I think the reason I, I guess I mentioned is because I think it's also important to acknowledge the ways that these, uh, they're all, it was, from, yeah, it was all, it was an entire, entirely from the New York Times. Um, and it's, you know, honestly, like I don't, again, I think that the, the main takeaway from that series to me was more that like, Companies are dropping the ball, not uh, we need the government to come in and like, or that like, if like there are supposed to be, you know, government making rules about how companies address this issue. Like, I don't think that the solution is create a committee that, that pursues like telling the companies what to do in this way that doesn't actually seem to have anything to do with the actual problem they're talking about. Um, totally. And yeah. we actually, I just want to also say that on the 21st Hacking Hustling will be hosting a legal literacy panel where we'll, we will be talking about the ways that um, fear and threats to national security are used to pass uh, laws that police us further, that want to end encryption, that want to do away with our privacy. So if you check out Hacking Hustling, dot com slash events, I think um, you should be able to find more about that. Again, that one's at 7 p.m. on the 21st and we'll be going a lot more. We'll be doing an update on where Earn It is now, what to look out for and some similar legislation that's been passed. Yeah, um, one thing, Glenn, this is a question for you. Uh, I know I did see that um, there was like a new, there was a, I saw an article that said that a bill was being worked on that was basically like in response to earn it, uh, trying to say like, yes, this is this problem you're claiming that you're going to address, like it's bad, but it's so like, this is not the way to do it and trying to come up with an alternative. I think Ron Wyden was involved. Do you know anything about this? Yeah, I think that's, yes, yes. And we will talk about that on the 21st. I'm not, but we'll have our legal team talk okay. about that. So I don't say the wrong thing. Okay. Looking forward. Um, Olivia, do you want to do the platform alternatives? Oh, I feel like I've just been talking a lot. <laughs> sure. Um, so it kind of sucks that we're all kind of stuck here using really centralized social media platforms that we don't control um, and that kind of in like nefarious and really complicated ways 
con sometimes control us. Um, and so you might be thinking to yourself, geez, I wish there was something else I could use that wasn't quite Instagram, it wasn't quite Twitter, um, that would still let me interact with my community and share information. So we have some alternatives. One of these alternatives is called Mastodon. Um, and essentially it's a independent, is that the word? Um, I think the word an is- An instance. An, it's an instance, there you go. Um, it's an instance of, oh no, I don't think that's the word either. Um, Actually, I, Mastodon is a very, is a Twitter-like platform that's not Twitter. And instead of um, going on like a centralized place, you can set up your own Mastodon instance for your community. Um, so instead of having, like you might have Mastodon instances that are called other names, um, kind of like, I, would a good analogy be like a subreddit? Maybe, I, I think like the, um, the existence of things, like so Mastodon is also a, a, from a project to create um, like open standards for social networking tools. Um, I think we talked a little bit about sort of standardizing of browsers and web content. And um, in, in the last decade, one that's been in development is one for just creating an open standard of what like a social network should do and could be. Um, the protocol is actually called Activity Pub, um, and Mastodon is built on top of it. Uh, it's it's more it's kind of like it, the the term used for like how they're actually set up is like federated. So like, maybe, yeah, like you make a Mastodon like you set up a Mastodon on a hosting service that's your own, and it can connect to other Mastodon uh, like sites that ex that other people run and host but you have to decide whether or not you connect to those sites. Um, and I, I think the, the example, the thing that, um, sorry, I can, I can jump off from here because I think the next part was just acknowledging the like limitations of that. Because <laughs> uh, I think, so um, with, so this is a screenshot of uh, Twitter, which is, had been kind of set up as a sex work friendly alternative to Twitter after uh, SESTA. And um, it has run into a lot of issues with uh, staying online because of Fosta SESTA. Um, their hosting in the, like I think Cloudflare was originally their hosting service and they got taken down uh, um, because com the company that like made, the, you know, the company that was hosting it didn't want to potentially get hit with, you know, like liabilities because Fausto Sesta said you were facilitating sex trafficking or some shit. Um, so there, it's it's not a necessarily like, uh, like it's not easy necessarily to set up a separate space. Um, and whether setting up a separate space is what you want is also like a question. Um, Another option is also, um, say you have a community that's on Instagram or on Twitter um, and you guys are facing a lot of al algorithmic suppression and you're not able to like reliably communicate to the people who follow your page. You also have the option of having, of splitting it both ways, right? Instead of having uh, Instagram and using it as your single channel, you could also try um, having like an additional way of communicating to people. So you might have like a Twitter page where you have announcements, but then have like a Discord server or something where you communicate with community members or similar things. Um, and those types of interventions would essentially allow you to avoid certain types of alg algorithmic suppression. Um, yeah, and in a way that the, uh, the construction of an alternative, it's I think the, the vision probably is not to create like a new Facebook or a new, you know, Twitter or new Instagram because you will just have the same problems <laughs> of those services, but um, rather to think about making sort of intentional spaces, um, like either like within, you know, your own space. This is a screenshot of Run Your Own Dot Social, which is a, a guide created by Darius Kazemi on, you know, the way. Uh, it, 
in some ways a lot of it's about you know community management and what it means to kind of like create intentional online spaces that I just found really really useful for thinking about this stuff. All right, so I think that those were all our slides. I actually um, just wanted to add one little thing about about that just to follow up on that in the previous two slides. Um, I, I think it's important to note too that like while there are these alternatives uh, on Macedon and these various different alternatives that that's often not where our clients are so when like I think that it can be helpful for certain things but the idea that entire communities and their clients will shift over to a separate platform isn't going to like capture the entire audience that you would have had if you had the same access to these social media tools that your peers did. So I think just one thing that I've been recommending for folks to do is to actually like mailing lists, I think can be really helpful in this too, to make sure that you have multiple ways of staying in touch with the people that are important to you or the people that are paying you. Um, because we don't know what the stability is of a lot of these other platforms as well. It's yeah, really that's, email is forever. Yeah, yeah, that's a really, really good way to say, you know, point. And thank you for adding that. Um, okay, so I guess um, should we? Oh, I guess we're open now for uh, qu more questions. Um, if there's anything we didn't cover or anything that you want kind of more clarification on, um, yeah, I see. It hand raised in the participants section, but I don't know if that means a question or something else or if, uh, or I also don't know how to address a raised hand. <laughs> so. Yeah, if you raise your hand, I can allow you to speak if you want to, but you will be recorded and this video will be archived. So unless you're super down for that, just please ask the questions in the Q&A. Someone asks, can you say more about Discord? Is it an instance like Twitter or Macedon? What is security like there? Um, so Discord is a is not an in, instance like Twitter on Mastodon. It's its own separate app, um, and it originated as a way for gamers to talk to each other, um, like while they're playing like video games. Um, and so there's a lot of a lot of the tools that are currently on it still make kind of more sense for gamers than they do for people who are talking normally. Um, a Discord server isn't really an actual server. It's more so a, a chat room that can be maintained and moderated. Um, and security um, is not private in the sense that um, all chats and logs can be seen by the folks at like at Discord HQ. Um, and they say that they don't look at them, that they would only look at them in the instance of like someone complaining about abuse. So if you say like, hey, this person's been harassing me, then someone would look at the chat logs from that um, time. But it's definitely not, it's not a secure platform. And it's not, uh, it's not end-to-end -end encrypted unless you use like add-ons, which can be downloaded and like integrated into a Discord experience, but it's not out of the box. It's mostly a space for like communities to gather. That helpful. Is the information on the 21st up yet or that is to come? I think this is for the event. This yeah, for this is for July 21st. I'll drop a link into the chat right now. Uh, how would you suggest dealing with misinformation that goes deep enough that research doesn't clarify, thinking about the ways the state uses misinformation about current events in other countries the US uses to justify political situations? Um, <sighs> Yeah, this is this is a hard one. Um, the question of just yeah, the the depths to which misinformation goes. I think one of the really hard things about distinguishing and uh, responding to misinformation in this this in like right in this current moment um, is doing is kind of. No, it, like it is very hard to understand who is an authoritative source to trust um, because 
we know that the state lies and we know that the press follows lies, right? Like I, I imagine some of you were alive in 2003. Maybe some of you were born in 2003. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I, again, I feel old, but um, like the, the and like, you know, it's not even like even just looking at history, like there are, there are lots of legitimate reasons to be suspicious of, of so-called authoritative institutions. Um, and I think that some of the, the hard things with those, with this, with like you know, getting full answers um, is being able to, is like finding, finding a space to like kind of also just hold like that maybe you don't know and because like, and that actually maybe you can't know for sure. Um, which, I th which is to say, um, maybe, okay, so one example of this. Uh, so I live in, in New York. I don't know how many of you uh, were, are based near here or, or heard about, we had this fireworks situation this summer. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about like, is this like a op, is this like some sort of like psych psychological warfare being enacted because like there were just so many fireworks. And you know, the, it's also true that like fireworks were really like cheap because fireworks companies didn't have more fireworks jobs to do. Um, I personally was getting lots of like promoted ads to buy fireworks. But uh, like at the end of the day, like the only way that I could kind of like safely manage like my own sense of like sanity with this was to say like, I don't know which thing is true. And the thing that and like neither of these things address the actual thing that I'm faced with which is like loud noise that's stressing out my dog um and it's so I think that some I think the question with like this information about sort of who to trust or what trust is also understanding like based on like what I assume a narrative what a narrative is true or isn't true like what am, what actually do I do <laughs> um and how do I kind of like make decisions to act based on that? Or can I act on either of these? Um, there is, that's kind of a rambly answer, but I think it's like there isn't always a good one. Um, I just dropped a link to, it's Yochai Benkler, Robert Ferris and Hal Roberts Network Propaganda, Manipulation, Disinformation and Radicalization in American Politics. I think from, I think it was 2018. Um, it's a really interesting read if you're interested in thinking and learning more about that. Um, um, just there are two other questions. I just want to quickly answer what happened in 2003 is America invaded Iraq based on pretenses of weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist. And, you know, companies like like news outlets completely reported that with with no meaningful interrogation. <laughs> Sorry. Um, read TikTok. Um, it's a really confusing situation because most places, especially a lot of cybersecurity experts on the internet have been saying to delete TikTok. Um, but also a lot of that, a lot of the reasons that it's being done so are kind of boiling down to it's a Chinese app, which is really xenophobic. Um, but there are, TikTok does track a lot of information about you, what it uses it for mostly looks like it's to like send you like really really hyper specific TikToks um but it definitely is like that information is being collected about you and it exists in their hands so I think it's mostly um a decision for individuals to make about whether they're going to decide to trust TikTok with their information in that way because they absolutely know where you live and they definitely know whatever things about you that you feel like they've gathered in order to create the TikTok algorithm and algorithm that shows up in your feed. Um, those things can be like, those things are true. So is, I think, Ingrid, do you have anything to say on that? You're still muted, Ingrid, if you're trying to oh, talk. Thank you, sorry. Uh, I am. Um... The question also asked, you know, if if things like the data collection on platforms like TikTok was worse than things like Earnit, and I think the the it d kind of depends on where you think like sources of harm are going to be. I think that it's 
they're, you know, it's kind of just, it's different. Like, you know, there's a bunch of information that a company now has that they could choose to sell, that they could choose to utilize in other ways, um, that they might give to a law enforcement agency that gets a subpoena. Um, but whether or not, um, but like Earn It and, and FOSTA, SESTA are examples of, uh, like they're, those are, that's a, I guess a different kind of harm. That harm has more to do with less about collection of information and more about suppression of content and information um, and of certain kinds of speech. Um, is it fair to say that social media companies can use your username alone to connect you to other accounts? Um, should we slightly modify our usernames to avoid being associated and shut down all at once? Um, so I think, I mean, I would, I would say is just for the question of like whether to modify your username or not, I think that that's also a risk assessment question insofar as like if you need people to be able to find you across multiple platforms, I would not want to tell you to like not do that <laughs> um, or to like make it harder for you to like reach uh, clients or an audience. Um, I think social media companies tend to, whether they're looking for you across platforms, like is not as clear to me. I think it depends on the like agreements that exist within the platform. So like, I know that, uh, I mean like Facebook and Instagram are owned by the same company, right? So they will end up sharing, like, like the sharing of those two identities like is fairly, you know, that's likely to happen. Um, but- companies might not be looking for your other accounts, but if you're ever like being investigated by like, Act like an actual individual person or like say your local de police department or the state in general, they probably would be. Yeah, and in, in that case, I think that what may be more helpful is if you have sort of a public persona that you wanna have kind of have a similar identity, that's, that's, that's a choice you can make. And then if there's like alt accounts that you know are maybe where you have more personal like communications or are work you know kind of more connected to community and less business um that making those slightly harder to associate or making those slightly more compartmentalized and we'll talk a little bit about about sort of compartmentalizing identities a little bit tomorrow um but i think yeah that's that's one way to kind of address that ability of being kind of identified I think too, I wanted to add um, that it's not just like using the same username, but where you post it or like what email is associated with an ad. Um, if you've linked your social media to a sex working ad, one of the statistics that we found that in the research that the ongoing research project that Hacking Hustling is doing right now on content moderation and shadow banning is that sex workers who have linked their social media to a sex worker advertisement are significantly more likely to believe that they've been shadow banned at 88.42%, which seems to indicate to me that linking your uh, social media account to a sex worker advertisement might put you in the, the bad girl bin, as I call it. Do we have any other questions? We still have a good chunk of time or anything that folks want more clarity on. Okay, so we have one that says, I heard DuckDuckGo mentioned, do you personally use that search engine? Also, I recently started using ExpressVPN as I just started sex work and bad on my part. I did little research on which VPNs to use. Have you heard of ExpressVPN? Do you have another app that you personally use or have more knowledge about? I wanna stay safe and of course share with others what would be the best app to use for a VPN. Um, Olivia, do you want to take uh some of this one? Sorry, I was muted. Um, so I do use DuckDuckGo most often. Uh, sometimes if I'm trying to like test to see like if something, 
like if I'm using another, like my house computer uses Google because my mom's like, I don't like DuckDuckGo. It's not showing me the things I want to see. Um, and that's usually because Google, again, collects data about you and su actively suggests results that it thinks are the things that you're searching for, whether or not they're what you're actually searching for. Um, for VPN use, I use Proton VPN mainly because it's free and I don't really have money to pay for a VPN right now. But I think ExpressVPN is one of the most popular ones. So I'd say it's pretty trustworthy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've used Express Netflix. Yeah. I've I've used it. It's I've like seen that it's yeah, it's it's generally I think a well regarded one. I think that's partly why it costs money the money it costs. Um so I think you yeah. If you don't want to have to keep paying for it, uh, but if you've already paid for it, then yeah, keep using it. Um, yeah, can we talk about some alternatives for encryption, assuming a backdoor is created? Um, this so isn't really an. Oops. Go ahead. Um, this isn't really an, an alternative for encryption, um, but I think one of the things that we could start doing is uh, less so would it be like trying to function without encryption, but instead encrypting our messages ourselves? Um, because technically you could have end-to-end -end encryption over Instagram DM if you do the mathematics of hand encrypting the message, message, messages that you send by, by yourself. Oof, bleh, shipped over my tongue there. Um, so there are, a lot of, there are a lot of apps specifically for email I'm thinking of, um, like Enigmail and Pretty Good Privacy that are essentially tools that you can use to hand encrypt, in quotation marks, um, your email so that you don't have to depend on like an, a provider doing that for you, right? Because the government can't like knock on your door and say, you're not allowed to encrypt things securely anymore. Um, and encryption algorithms are mathematical things. Um, so you wouldn't be able to like make an encryption algorithm that's like kind of broken. The ones that we have now are, as long as like Signal for instance is very public about the algor algorithms that they use and that's how we know that we can trust them because other people can test them and they're like, yeah, it's really, it would take a computer about a thousand years to crack this. Um, and so we're able to use those same algorithms by ourselves with that depending on other platforms to do that work for us. And it would suck that we'd have to interact with each other with that level of friction, um, but it is possible to continue to have safe communications. Yeah, and I think just in general, if you're unsure about the security of the messaging system that you're using, like right now we're using Zoom and we had this conversation a bit yesterday, but I'm speaking on Zoom as if I were speaking in public. So if I were to say, uh, if I wanted to talk about my personal experiences, potentially I would phrase it as a hypothetical is also one way. So just slightly changing the way, ways that you speak um, or, um, yeah, I think that's also an option. Go ahead, Olivia, sorry. Um, no, I, I just bouncing off of that, like agreeing with the people that you're talking to that like, hey, we're not gonna talk about this um, and not being like reckless. So in a, like in a public forum, don't like post about the direct action that's happening on Sunday at City Hall, like things like that um, are not things, just like using in that sense, using discretion at that point. Someone says, so the backdoor issue is for companies that encrypt for us? Um, basically, yeah, the, the, the backdoor issue, or like what I guess the backdoor issue is, is not, and it's also not necessarily like all encryption would stop working, right? It would be something like, uh, you know, the government, like a government saying like, hey, WhatsApp, like we, we want access to conversations that, currently we can't have access to because WhatsApp communications are in and encrypted and ordering WhatsApp to change that. And, and in, one would hope um, that like companies also know that they have a certain amount of like 
brand liability, but when they remove security features. Um, so it's something that would probably be known about. I don't think that it would be done, like I would hope it wouldn't be done surreptitiously. Um, but yeah, it's it's more about like whether or not certain place, like previously considered secure communications would become compromised. Um, it would necessarily end the possibility of ever, you know, in deploying encryption ever again, it would be probably more of a service by service level thing. We still have some time for more questions. If anyone has any, please feel free to drop them into the Q and A. And maybe if Ingrid and Olivia, if you wanted to chat a little bit about what we'll be talking about tomorrow, folks might have an idea of other things that they might want clarity on or other things that they are really hoping might be covered. Yeah, tomorrow we're gonna talk a lot about surveillance, like more specifically. So like surveillance that's done on platforms um, and in, but also like talking both about surveillance capitalism and state surveillance and how they, um, the different ways that they might cause harm for someone who's like on trying to use the internet. Um, yeah, I think those are the most, the biggest points, um, but also thinking about um, like mitigation. Yeah, and um, we're, and in, in the context of state surveillance, we're primarily talking about when the state utilizes uh, platforms in the service of surveillance or obtains information from platforms, um, there are a, there are a myriad of other ways that the state can that you know police departments or federal or state governments can engage in surveillance of of people digitally or otherwise. Um, but partly because uh, the the scale and scope of that topic is very very large, and because we know people are coming from lots of different settings and maybe, and like, we, we don't personally know the ins and outs of the surveillance tools of every police department in the world. Uh, we didn't want to kind of put forward like examples of tools that might just be like, that, that would mostly just create like greater like anxiety or something or, or that wouldn't necessarily be an accurate depiction of threats or realities that people might face. Um, if there's interest in more of those things, like we're happy, I'm like happy to do questions about them in the thing, but it's not something that we did. We're doing a deep dive into because again, it seems like that might be better to do more tailored questions to specific contexts. Um, did you see the EFF launch there's the searchable database of police agencies and the tech tools that they use to spy on communities? Oh, speaking, yeah. speaking of not terrifying people. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I mean, but that's the thing. It's another thing is like, it's like, well, those, those tools are here. They, God, God bless the, these agencies, these, you know, organizations for putting that work together. Cool. So I'll just give it like two or three more minutes to see if any other questions pop in. Um, and then I'll just turn off the live stream as well as the recording in case anyone would prefer to ask a question that's not public. Okay, so we have two more questions that just popped in. Could you speak to building healthy community online, how to do that, how to use platforms for positive information spread? Um, so when it comes to building healthy communities, I think um, it really comes down to like the labor of moderation. Like it has to, it has to go to someone. I think we often have uh, one of the problems with a lot of platforms online is that they're built by people who don't really like see a need for moderation, if that makes sense. Like one of the issues with Slack is that there was no way to block someone in Slack. And a lot of the people who originally were working on Slack couldn't conceive of a reason why that would be possible, couldn't conceive of, a, conceive of a reason why that would be necessary. Um, 
well, while someone who's ever experienced workplace harassment would know immediately why that kind of thing would be necessary, right? Um, and so I think when it comes to like building healthy communities online, I think like codes of conduct are really honestly the thing that's most necessary um, and having people or having um, creating an uh, environment on that specific profile or in that specific space that kind of invites that energy in for the people who are engaging in that space to do that moderation work and to also like promote pro-social interactions and to like demo anti-social interactions and things like that. I also think um, that we, Hacking Hustling also on the YouTube channel has um, a conversation between myself and three other folks uh, talking about sort of, sort of social media and propaganda and a couple of harm reduction tips on how to assess the like truthfulness of what you're sharing and posting. And I think that's one thing that we can do is just take an extra second before retweeting something and sharing something or actually opening up the article before sharing it and making sure that it's something that we wanna share is a simple thing that we can do. I know things move so fast on these in online spaces that it's sometimes hard to do, but I think that that, if, if you're able to assess that something is misinformation or maybe something that you don't want to share, then it slows down the spread of misinformation. Thank you so much to everyone and their awesome questions. I'm just gonna take one second to turn off the YouTube live and to turn off the recording and then see if folks have any questions that they don't want recorded.